Okay, so we're on um, Acts, Acts chapter 20, um, and this is uh, from verses 1 to 16. Uh, the, just a basic summary of the story is, is Paul is going uh, from Ephesus and he goes to uh, Macedonia. Now, as he goes through there, now this is after that big uproar of what happened last week when um, it was Demetrius and the craftsmen, and they were going against Paul and the gospel. Now, he encourages them, and then he goes to Macedonia. Now, when he's through Macedonia, he goes through encouraging the churches through the word, and then he gets to Greece, stays there for about three months, and then he wants to set sail from there to Syria. Now, Syria is Antioch. That's where his home church is. Instead of going there because of the Jews that wanted to um, go against him, he ends up backtracking. So he goes back through Macedonia. Now, as he goes through Macedonia, he picks up these people that we'll talk about in verse 4. And then he goes from there, and they start making their way uh, to Jerusalem. Now, they don't get to Jerusalem in this part where we're talking about, but they end up at Troas, and then we hear about Eutychus, dies, comes back to life. Um, and then they continue on in their journey through to Jerusalem. Okay, so point one is from verses 1 to 6, and that is we must continue encouraging the church with God's word in all situations. I have it there. Um, if you can see it, let's read it together. After the uproar was over, Paul sent for the disciples, encouraged them, and after saying farewell, departed to go to Macedonia. And when he had passed through those areas and offered them many words of encouragement, he came to Greece and stayed three months. The Jews plotted against him and he, for Syria, and so he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Phyrus from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy and Tychicus, and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us in Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread. In five days we reached them at Troas, where we spent seven days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there's a next slide will be a map. That way so you can see what's going on. Now, the green one is Ephesus. After encouraging uh, the disciples there, after that big uproar, then he goes through Macedonia. Now he goes through all those churches, that's Philippi and everywhere, and gets to Greece, stays for three months, and then the Jews plotted against him. That's why you'll see the loop, he backtracks back. Now, as he goes back, he picks up all those that are in verse 4, and then he gets to Philippi. But a lot of them continue on to Troas. That's where they meet. Now, if you notice, if you've got Bibles there, you'll notice that some of the wording changes. Right, and if you remember that Acts is written by Luke. So when Luke says that, the men, that's in verse 4, they go and wait at Troas, but he's with Paul. Right? And they come to Philippi, and they, um, they stay there for the unleavened bread festival, which goes for about a week in Exodus 12, verse 14 uh, to 20. And it took him about five days to reach Troas, which you'll see there in the dark blue. And they stay there for another, day, uh, another seven days. Now, the reason why he went back through Macedonia to pick up a lot of people is because... The accusation. Now, that's what Alec was talking about in the Torah sermon, and, and, this is, and it's true, that they would begin to accuse Paul of stealing. It was a large sum of money, and that was the money, the gift from the Macedonian churches that were supposed to go to Jerusalem and help them. And they started accusing, so he picks up all these people that are in, with good integrity in the church to go with him. Now, there's reasons. could be protection from the thing, but it wasn't just that. It was so that they could trust Paul and that there were people there to work with him to go and take these monies so he won't be accused of taking the money. And we have that here in our in our Kangama policy. The, the ministers have no say in the money. They can't even sign on it. And these are one of the precautions that are taken. Uh, so it is a good habit to develop as he goes through in all your situations, whatever it is, whether you're struggling with finances, whether it's a celebration, or like here, plots to harm you because of your belief in Christ, we should always be encouraged from the word. We always come back to the word. 
And that's what Paul was doing. After what happened with the uproar, he encouraged them with the word. They went to Macedonia, again, encouraging them with the word. And then he picks up people that are within Christ and they go together. Now, there's two differences that you'll notice from worldly encouragement and encouragement from Christ. Right? The world encouragement will tell you to work hard, dedicate yourself to your job, to your studies, maybe your sports, right? and, they, and you will be successful. That's what they tell us. If I give you an example of the NRL, the football, thousands of people will try out for this, but not everyone gets in. It's a, what, 17, 18 player game? Not everyone gets in. You have people that live, breathe football, and they still don't get in. And then what, what does the world tell you? The encouragement they tell you is, well, tough luck. That's the world. That's life. You can move on, do something else. After spending half your life trying to get into NRL team, that's what the worldly encouragement will tell you. Christ, different. Right? Paul is the example here. He goes through and encourages him through the word. Why through the word? Well, because it's a guarantee. It's truth. The, world, the, the Bible might not tell you how to fix a car, but it will tell you how to get salvation. The, that's what the whole point is. It's to save you from an eternity of destruction. Right? And we have that guarantee in Christ. And we surround ourselves like here with people in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 13 to 14. Now, 2 Corinthians there is just so you can see. It's not for us to read. It's just to see why he went back to pick up these people in verse 4 with the money. Now, if we can see Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, if we can read it together. In him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, when, when you believed. The Holy Spirit is a down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there's a guarantee. The Holy Spirit's a down deposit. All your hard efforts that you do for NRL, if you are a sports person, there's no guarantee there. There's no guarantee. But here, Christ, God's work has already guaranteed you. So when you are hindered or when people come and they plot against you, we don't worry about it. We take our encouragement from God. Why? Because God is the sovereign over all things. Maybe it was a good thing. But we don't take our encouragement from the word. From the world, we take it from the word. Now point two is from verses seven to twelve, and that is God's word will have two responses. You either fall away to our death or be made alive and comforted. Now verse seven to twelve, if you see it, let's read together. On the first day of the week we assembled to break bread. Paul spoke to them, and since he was about to depart the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were assembled, and a young man named Eutychus was sitting on a windowsill and sank into a deep sleep as Paul kept on talking. When he was overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was picked up dead. But Paul went down, bent over him, embraced him, and said, Don't be alarmed, because he's alive. After going upstairs, breaking the bread and eating, Paul talked a long time until dawn. Then he left. They brought the boy home alive and were greatly comforted. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there's a few things here. The first day of the week for the Jews is a Sunday. That is the first day of the week. And that's why we worship. We worship on the Sunday as well. Now, there's a bit of a... I think the seven days don't believe in that because they go by the Sabbath of the Jewish, but we celebrate the Lord's resurrection. So that's why we are on the Sunday. But also Paul here, he, he talks here, and it's almost a gathering as the first Sunday worship. Now, they assembled to break bread. Breaking bread is either the Lord's Supper or you're sharing a meal. We used to do that a lot. We used to do that in the old hall where we gathered together. We started from sandwiches, and then all of a sudden we had a big table of pigs. That's, that's what... The food was, but it wasn't meant to go that big. All right? It was just meant to, for us to have something to strengthen us, talk about the gospel, and then leave. Now, he was leaving the next day, so he starts talking to them until midnight. Now, when there's many lamps in the room, you can tell 
that there was a lot of people because there was no electricity there. There was no lights that we have here. It was all lamp, oil lamps. And that's how you can tell there was many people in the upstairs room. If you look at a concert, if we would turn off the lights here and everyone pull out their phones, it would look like a lot of people. And that's why it's over here. It was a lot of people. Now, a young man named Eutychus was sitting on a windowsill and fell asleep as Paul's talking. Now, Paul's not just talking about anything. He's talking about the gospel. He's telling him about Jesus. He fell, he fell out from the first story and picked up dead. I believe he was dead because Luke is a doctor. Luke's going around. If, if you can't know, if you don't know, if you're a doctor and you don't know if someone's dead, you shouldn't be a doctor. But he is a doctor and he knew Eutychus was dead. It wasn't until Paul came down, embraced him and told everyone, don't be alarmed, he's alive. Now they go back upstairs, break bread. Again, they're eating, sharing a meal together, continuing to talk about the gospel. Now, once Paul leaves the next day, they brought the home, the boy home alive and were greatly comforted. See, many will come to hear the word. Many. But when we hear it, do we fall asleep? Are we falling asleep when we hear the word? Look, I understand if you're tired, if you're tired from work, that's understandable. But if every time you read the word and you come to hear the gospel and you just sleep, then something's wrong. And it's a warning. It's not a, it should be a warning because it means the gospel is veiled. It means that we are not being saved. See, when Eutychus fell asleep, fell off the window. You know, if we fall asleep from the gospel and we fall away, and we fall away from Jesus, there's no one to come and help us. No one. So it's a warning. It's a good warning that if you come to church, fair enough. If you're tired, you're tired. But if you're reading it every day and you cannot get through one chapter because you're sleeping, it means the gospel is veiled. We should ask God to not harden our hearts. Right? We don't want to fall away. Uh, but if you're not sleeping, you feel comforted, you feel alive. That's what the gospel does. That's what it does to those that really humble themselves to Christ. And you should be comforted by the gospel. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. We can see it. Let's read together. For what makes everything visible is light. Therefore it is said, get up, sleeper, and rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So when we hear the gospel, if you're not rising up, you're falling asleep, maybe ask Christ, ask God, close your eyes and pray, and then try and wake up again, and listen to the gospel. Right? It is, this, these days are evil. You've got so many things going against it at the moment. But we don't worry about it because Christ is sovereign over all. We make the most of our time when we come here. We come here because we want to hear the word of God. The last point is from verses 13 to 16, and that is the ministry vision of the gospel will come with sacrifices. If you can see it, let's read together. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Asos, where we were going to take Paul on board, because these were his instructions. Since he himself was going by land, when he met us at Asos, we took him on board and went on to Mytilene. Sailing from there, the next day we arrived off Chios. The following day we crossed over to Samos, and the day after we came to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia because he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, for the day of Pentecost. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, Luke, there's a, another map. So this is their traveling. All right? They're starting from Troas, just above Asos there in the highlighted green. And then it goes Asos, they come to Mytilene, to Chios, Samos, and Miletus, which is inland. Right? And that's where they landed. Now, right at the beginning, Luke and that set off sail to Troas, to Asos, from Troas to Asos, and they pick up Paul there, because Paul wanted to travel by land. Now, they went from there again to those highlighted areas you can see. Now, Paul decides something. He wants to sail straight past Ephesus. You know, if throughout the whole Acts, he's been stopping at nearly every church. 
He's been going through, stopping, encouraging them. For him to sail past Ephesus, it must be something serious. And it is. Now, he wants to get to Jerusalem, not only because he has the gift. It's a big sacrifice to him. Instead of stopping at Ephesus to encourage the Ephesus church, he goes straight past them and he's on his way to Jerusalem. But at the moment, they're in Miletus, right? So he's, that's his sacrifice he makes. Now, see our vision for the church. We read it out every Sunday to grow spiritually and numerically. See, Kalasi Aho, Kalasi Aho is so important. Do we sacrifice the time? that we have at home to do Kalashi Aho? Or, you know, if you're chasing to go somewhere after church, we have Kalashi Aho here for those that can't make it during the week. Do we sacrifice for that? What about uh, to train workers for God's harvest? We have Grafe Basement Seminary. Our church, Ma'afu, is teaching heaps of people from overseas, all over the world. What about us? Are we willing to sacrifice half an hour to 40 minutes of our time to come in and hear and learn, whether it's in English or in Tongan? What about training? What about our growing godly elders? Through our lot fear, through our, our prayer programs. Is, is it a lot to give up at least half an hour, 40 minutes to pray? Pray that God raise up godly people in our church. So even telling others about Jesus, will you sacrifice your comforts? Are you afraid to lose friends? Will you sacrifice your comfort to proclaim Christ? Loving the poor, our tithing. That goes to loving the poor. See, these are all sacrifices that will come with the gospel. But then you have to prioritize what, what you prefer. If you really, really want to do the worldly things, then all these won't matter to you. But if you really love Christ, you would always put him first. You'd make the effort, just as we make the effort to go to the places that we really want to go to. It's the same with the gospel. We put Christ ahead of us. Now, John chapter 15, verse 16, it's there. If you see it, let's read. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit, and that your fruit should remain. So that wherever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You're all here today for a reason. You were chosen. Chosen by God. It says there, I chose you. Now, did he choose you to fall away from the gospel or did he choose you to maybe be made alive in the gospel? Here's the question. Did he choose you to make him a priority or did he choose you as a warning that if you fall away and you don't pick Christ then there's consequences. We didn't choose Christ, Christ chose us. Now the summary here is whatever situation you're in, whether you're being persecuted as a church or your faith, trust in Christ. Encourage from the word of God here. Don't worry about a book that tells you how to deal with feelings. Here, look here, here, this one. This will help you, the Bible. Now, what's the response does God's word have for us in our lives? Is it for making us fall away, fall asleep, away from the salvation? Or are we made alive and comforted through him? See, the ministry vision will come with sacrifices. You've got to make sacrifices. Paul did it. Everyone does it. If you want the ministry vision, God's vision, to be priority. Will you sacrifice your time and your comforts for Christ? Or is that too much? Amen.